Yes, Lord, that is our prayer. We are in desperate need of you. Come fill this place, fill our lives right now. Sweep away all the things that would distract us, all the things of this earth that we get distracted by. And I pray that you would receive all the attention right now as we open your word, all of the glory right now. May you be, may you be glad because what you see in our lives and the words that come out of our mouths. Thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can have a seat. If you have your Bibles, you can grab them and turn to Luke chapter 14 as we continue in our parable series, Luke chapter 14. Today we are going to look at two parables that are sandwiched in between some of Jesus' heaviest teachings. Jesus had some pretty heavy things to say when he was here on this earth. In fact, once his own disciples, his own 12 disciples turned to him and said, these are hard things, who can accept them? That was in John chapter 6, and Jesus was saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus had some really hard things to say. But what we're going to talk about today is perhaps one of the hardest Deep in the earth, there is this substance called coal. We dig it out, we mine it out, we bring it up, and we can burn it. Yeah, it has some value, but we can burn it, but after it's burned and we use the energy, it's gone. But if that same coal stays in the ground over a long period of time and is subjected to an enormous amount of weight and pressure, it produces something else. You know what it is? Diamonds. My prayer this morning is that we would feel the, the weight, the heaviness, the pressure of what Jesus has to say to us. And that it would produce something of immeasurable, eternal value in our lives. So I don't know about you, but I have become immune to the sales pitch of our day. You know what I'm talking about? The sales pitch, whether it's, whether it's a kiosk in the mall, whether it's a telemarketer, whether it's a credit card company, or whether it's commercials, those ones that promise everyone, that seem like, like there's smoke and mirrors, that there's kind of a, a bait and switch to this, this whole thing. You know what I'm talking about? I, I was in the mall a while ago, and I was walking down the hallway, and there was those kiosks and those aggressive salesmen come at you trying to sell things. And, and I usually I take a wide berth or and I shake my head and, and just politely say no. But this time somehow I just turned and the guy was right there and he caught me in this 20 second thing. He was good. He was slick. And he had this credit card. And he said, look how this looks in your wallet. <laughs> and it was a picture on the card of a Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, and he showed me this picture quickly of this guy using this credit card with a smile on his face, as if to say, with a you know, Maple Leafs jersey, as if to say, if you use this credit card, you will be supporting this useless hockey team. <laughs> and all of your affections towards this hockey team are then placed onto this card, so every time you use it, you might be supporting this hockey team, right? And I'd look how it looks in your wallet. That was slick, you know? And I, and I said, I, I declined. I said, no. We've become immune to the sales pitch of the day. Why? Because we know there's the fine print. We know that there's the fine print. There's a, there, there's a bait and switch. There's a, there's a smoke and mirrors. There's just these things that promise everything but cost you nothing. We know that there's something to that. We know that there's the fine print. Can you imagine if these credit card companies were in the mall and they had this big sign that said, 19%! 19% interest if you don't pay it on time, and it compounds over time. And here's a picture, by the way, of someone that's stressed out because of debt. If, if you think this is free money, this is what's going to happen to you. Here's a picture of Chernobyl. <laughs> this is what happened to your life if you think this is free money. 19%. you imagine if they led with that? No, they lead with the air miles, the, the free movie tickets, the... The, the, the little perks that you can get because of using this credit card. Now, I'm not against credit cards, but I think we've all become immune to the sales pitch of our day. I was in the gym just a few days ago, the local gym here, and I, 
I was, I was working out, and the only time I get to watch TV, I, I, we don't have, like, cable TV or anything, and so the sports is on, which is good, because I love sports, all these different sports. And I was, I was working out right in front of the TV, and I, just because of where the gym is situated, and, and I was actually literally holding onto the TV, so I was really close to the TV. And it was, it was, it was TSN, the sports network, and I, I was just doing the, these calf raises, and uh, the Ford Bronco has hit the market. This old vehicle that's now been retrofitted, it's, it's an amazing new vehicle. All this, these commercials about the, the Ford Bronco, and it just makes you want to just want to buy one of those because, you know, like they're, they're taking this $50,000 vehicle, and, and usually if you would spend that much money on a vehicle, you wouldn't do that stuff with a vehicle, you know, like drive it fast through the woods and up over these massive rocks at, at, at breakneck speeds and, and going through the water at breakneck speeds, and you're like, yeah, that's what I want. I want one of those things. But normally people wouldn't do the, that if they spend $50,000. So I'm watching this commercial, and I'm really close to the TV, like right here, and, and it shows a picture of the Bronco just going right through the water at breakneck speed. But then at the very bottom, there's a small, fine print that I can read because I'm like this close to the TV. It says, don't actually do this. <laughs> Check owner's manual for the speed at which you're supposed to go through the water. You could cause major damage to your vehicle if you actually go through the water. We, we've become immune to the sales pitch of our day because we know there's a bait and switch. There's a smoke and mirrors to it, right? You're, you're selling something that's not real. We know that there's... There's this fine print. Here's what it's really involved with this. Here's the potential cost. In our passage today, it says that large crowds were starting to follow Jesus. And he wanted to make sure that they knew what was involved in this, shall I say, kingdom membership. And they just weren't in it for the air miles, (laughs) pun intended. And so Jesus, he takes the fine print, you know, that stuff that's buried at the bottom, the fine print, and he makes it the capital, bold, large print. This is called full disclosure, right? Here's what it means to follow me. Here's what it means if you're to to take on this thing of, 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 of joining my kingdom and following me in this earth Here's what it means. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Let's read this as Jesus takes the fine print and he makes it the coal, the capital bold large print up front, full disclosure. Luke 14, 25. Why don't we stand as we read this? It says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay a foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider in there twice, sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Go ahead, have a seat. I was in the store the other day, and they have those long aisles that you wait in before you go to the cash register. You know those aisles with all the stuff about this high? They call this the impulse buying aisle, 
where you see something that you may need or you see something that you didn't know that they made, but now they make it and now you need it. And then impulse, you buy it and you put it in your cart and you end up buying it. It's called the impulse buying aisle. They don't want you to think it through. Jesus here refuses. He refuses to put his kingdom membership, quote unquote, in the impulse buying aisle. He wants to take the fine print and make it the capital, bold, large, underlined, italicized print at the front of the document. He really wants you to think this thing through and consider it from all angles. Do you really want to follow Jesus? He doesn't want to put it in the impulse buying out. Ooh, that looks flashy. Let's put that in. You can just feel the awkwardness of this moment. Large crowds... Verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Large crowds are what every organization wants, period. You want lots of people following. It means you got a good thing going on. But Jesus here senses that these th- people think it's all about the quote-unquote air miles, and they're not reading the fine print, so he takes the fine print and he makes it the capital, bold, large print, upfront, full disclosure, here's what it means to follow me. And he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross cannot be my disciple. Then he tells the two stories in there about the, the, someone building the tower, think it through, can sit down and consider. It tells the story of a, a king going to war. He sits down and considers. And he says, those who do not give up everything they have cannot be my disciple. I mean, you talk about an awkward moment. There's this book out, which is, I think, the top 10 selling books of all time in, in, in America. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And in the book, it basically says, tell people what they want to hear. Talk about what they want to talk about. Now, Jesus didn't read this book. <laughs> Do you think anyone wants to hear that? I want to hear about the air miles. I want to hear about the Bronco that can go through the, through the, through the water at about 150 kilometers an hour. I don't want to see the fine print. But Jesus takes the fine print and he makes it the bold capital large print. Hate your family? I mean, like, okay. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. What does he mean with this? What does he mean by saying, hate your family? We're not supposed to hate anyone. What? He's overstating something here, obviously. How many here have ever heard of a litmus test? A litmus test is, we use this in our vernacular sometimes. We say, that's a litmus test for spring coming. I even use it in the, in the welcoming. Like, if we're in shorts, that's kind of a litmus test for spring coming. It's... Uh, it's where you measure the whole of something by measuring just a small portion of it. So you, you, measure, you measure something really big, but you only measure just a small, of it, small portion of it. And you measure just a small portion of it, that'll tell you kind of what the rest is. If you, ever, have any of you ever had a swimming pool in here? Uh, you know, if you've ever had a swimming pool, you're always measuring the chemicals in the swimming pool and the pH balance and the acidity of the water and things like that. And, and, and depending on what it's like, you... You have to add more or, ta- or add this or that. And you, you get these little test kits from, from the store just for a few dollars and these little tiny pieces of paper, these strips of paper, and they have a chemical on them. And you dip them in the water. And depending on the color of that tells you what you're supposed to put into the pool. You, you, you've, most of you have done this, right? And, and, but you don't measure every molecule of water in your swimming pool. You just measure that drip, droplet of water. And that measuring that small part of it determines the rest of it. Or in, or in politics, um, sometimes you say this question for this politician is a litmus test. You ask this one particular question or this maybe two or three questions, and how they answer that question will tell you their political bent, whether they're left or right on the political scale. You don't have to ask every single question about the country right now to kind of get an understanding. That one question, if you, if you frame it just right, and how they answer it is a litmus test. It measures the whole of the person by just measuring a small piece of it. Well, in Jesus' day, there was a litmus test that measured your all-in commitment to Christ. 
Your posture towards this one issue will pretty much determine the rest of your heart allegiance. Does it, did it, will determine if Jesus is your everything. So you don't really need to measure every molecule in the pool. You can just measure this one issue. And that one issue in Jesus' day was family. His family. Would you be willing to make a decision, a life decision based on your allegiance to Jesus, based on your all-in affections and all-in commitment for Jesus that would tick off your family and be perceived as hate, that you hate them? Your posture towards that one issue in Jesus' day would determine your all-in commitment. How you respond to family measures the whole of your faith. Remember, remember, this is an honor and shame culture. I need to park here for just a few, one minute. An honor and shame culture, we live in an individualistic culture. An honor and shame culture is 100% of the audience of this book, and it's most of the world today and most of the people who have lived in history. And honor and shame culture is everything you do brings honor to your community, but specifically your family. Or shame to your family. Um, uh, when I, I went to a, uh, a conference once, and I listened to a, a missionary. And I've told this before, but I need to say it again. I, went to, I heard a missionary who did, spent about 20 years serving in an honor and shame culture. And he tried to get our North American minds, who were very individualistic and me, me, me focused, uh, and, and, and I determined my own destiny and I can do whatever I want, it help, help us to understand an honor and shame culture. And he put this picture up on the screen, and I've done this before, just bear with me. And in the picture, there was a, a man in the middle and he looked happy. And around him were about 15 to 20 people that looked upset, distraught, disinterested. Some were looking at him, some were looking away. They asked the exact same question to people in an individualistic North American or Western culture that they asked to people in an honor and shame culture. They asked them this simple question. It's not a trick question. Is that man in the middle who looks happy, surrounded by people who look up unhappy, is that man happy? Everyone in North America said, yeah. If it's not a trick question, he looks happy. He's probably happy. He's able to find his happiness in the midst of all of the, the unhappiness in the world. He's an individual, solid, lone ranger, yay. We go that, we would say that. Almost everyone in an honor and shame culture says, absolutely not. He is not happy. He can't be happy. He has obviously done something that has dishonored his family, that has brought shame to his family. His family is upset with him. He's putting on a show. There's no way that he can be happy. Just put that in your brain. Just to help us understand this, this is the culture that Jesus is talking to. In 1996, I was an 18-year-old boy, and I left high school in, in Nova Scotia. I flew to Saskatchewan, played, got on their hockey team. We went on a missions trip to Moscow, Russia. For a kid that had hardly left the Maritimes, go to Saskatchewan, and then go all the way across the world. It was an eye-opening thing. We played hockey, basically helping... Hockey Ministries International established relationships because hockey is big in Russia just like it is in Canada. It's kind of this inroads for evangelism. But then they would take us on these other days where we weren't playing hockey to see parts of Russia. And we were like 25 to 30 people of, of like coaches and players going around and so they going around Russia and so they put a lot of translators with us. A lot of Russian Christians that knew a bit of of uh, a bit of English so that we could kind of interact with the locals. Here's a picture. That is this guy in the middle. I'm going to tell you about him in a second. Just right of that, that's me, by the way. And sitting with me, I don't uh, Bear Domes used to come to this church. I met him. He played hockey with him. He's sitting right next to me there. Um, anyway, here we are in Russia. And this guy in the middle, his name is Alashir. Alashir, on one of these trips where we were traveling a couple hours outside of Moscow, um, I don't know where we are going, but he came around and he talked to every single one of us on the bus, and every single one of us 18, 19, 20-year-old hockey players, and he told us his story. He says, I came, or I come from a country that is south of Russia, 
He didn't tell us which one. So you're talking Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Saudi Arabia, one of those. And he said, I became a Christian. And when I became a Christian, my family wanted to kill me. And so I fled to Russia. This is like just a few years after the curtain had fallen. So it was open to Christianity, the Iron Curtain. And so here he was connected with this church in Moscow. And then he asked each one of us, would you be willing to die and give up your life and go to my country and tell them about the gospel? And he said, think about it. This is the type of culture that Jesus is telling this to. So we can understand this honor and shame culture. When he says, you, if you're going to follow me, you've got to hate your family. In another part in the Bible where Jesus talked about this exact same topic, he said it a little differently. He said, I did not come to bring peace but the sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. My buddy al Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So he says it a little bit different there. He's basically saying that Jesus wants all of our affections. He doesn't want us to share the love seat. He's not interested in an open relationship. Every other love and affection in your life needs to bow before your affections to Christ. We talked about this all the time, that God is a jealous God. And in the Bible, God talks about how he is the the, the groom and we are his bride. And he doesn't want us to, to go and put our affections on with anyone else. He wants us to love him, him exclusively. I'm, I'm, uh, I say some stupid dad things sometimes. Anyone? I, I, now I'm stupid because I, I have teenagers. But uh, I say, Caleb, you're my favorite son. He's my only son. I say, Leah, you're my favorite daughter. You're, you're, you're my only daughter. And then I'll go to my wife. You're my favorite wife. <laughs> and it doesn't have the same effect. Uh, <laughs> I, I say it tongue-in-cheek, but I probably should stop saying it. She's my only wife, by the way, and will be my only wife. Lord willing. Now she, she dies. Anyway, I'm, I'm <laughs> back up, back up here. You know what I'm saying here. But it doesn't, it doesn't stir her affections when I say, you're my favorite wife. No, you're my one and only wife, right? So Jesus, Jesus doesn't want us to say, you're my favorite. He, he wants us to say, you're, you're my one and only and will be my one and only. All my affections, the rest of my affections in my life always bow to this one here. This is where we're going today. Jesus does not just want to be part of your life. He wants to be your life. He just doesn't want you to to take him on and pick him up in the impulse buying aisle. He wants you to be your life. We have these t-shirts that say basketball is life, hockey is life, video games, whatever. But Jesus is life. He wants us to say that. He just doesn't want us to add him to our thing. He wants us to be our life. And in Jesus' day, and even today, how you respond to family will determine your commitment to Christ. That's a litmus test. If you're willing to make a decision that ticks off your family, not because of your depravity and they're just depravity going like this and you're fighting about where to put the toaster on the counter, that's depravity, okay? If you're willing to make a decision based on your allegiance and your affections for Christ that he is your Lord now, And he calls the shots. And this decision that I'm going to make right now is going to be perceived as hate by my family. That's almost a guarantee. Almost, shall I say. That's a litmus test. It's almost a guarantee that nothing else has stolen your affections for Christ in Jesus' day. You don't have to go through the laundry list of everything in your house and everything in your life. Do you love Jesus more than your car? Do you love Jesus more than your house? Do you love Jesus more than that dancing plastic snowman? Do you love Jesus more than your career? if, If you're willing to make a decision... It basically, ah, your family wants to, like my friend Alice Shear, kill you. That's pretty much a guarantee that your affections are all in Christ. That's a litmus test. Some of us, family is that litmus test. I talked to a young man who, who said uh, he thought his family was Christians until he 
decided that he wanted, God was calling him, or not decided, God decided for him because he was his Lord, that he was going to go to Bible school. And then his word says, was, I thought my dad was going to kill me. <laughs> I talked to another guy who became a Christian as a teenager. He went to Bible camp and God got a hold of his life and then he came back and his, none of his family was saved and so he would, he would go to youth group and learn about God and he'd go to church by himself and learn about God. And he said every day he'd come home, almost every day he'd come home in the evening and he'd walk by the family room and he had to walk by really fast because his dad was openly watching pornography in the family room and he'd have to run to his room, turn on the stereo really loud and start reading and get his mind focused on Jesus. I talked to other parents who who want to take this stance on gender that God made them male and female. We don't choose that. God chooses that for us, and it's causing major rifts with their children. They're standing on the truth. Do I love my family more than Christ? What's your litmus test that measures your commitment to Christ? In Jesus' day, you could say it was family, and a close second would have been one of Jesus' favorite topics that Jesus continually talked about in the Gospels, money. Money's a litmus test, too. And I should, shall I dare say, if I do we exegete our culture and study our culture, that in, in, in Alberta in 2021, we can probably invert those. Family is up there, but I would say that money is probably number one. Does Jesus have all of your money, or is it just 10%, or is it just a small portion of it, or does it have none of it? Give up everything, he says. Is money your litmus test? Is family your litmus test? And then Jesus goes on to say, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This would have been an absolutely shocking metaphor. You talk about an awkward moment where you hear crickets going, like a cross? We see this post-cross, looking back through the lens of the cross, they're seeing this as Jesus is en route to the cross. Early in Luke, we see Jesus is en route to the cross. And he says, you have to carry your cross? You mean that Roman torture stick thing that they kill people and humiliate people with? You, you have to carry that thing? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a man who Hitler killed right, a couple days before World War II ended. He would speak out against Hitler. He's quoted as saying in one of his books, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. Salvation is a free gift. Yes, it's a free gift, but it's a free gift that costs you everything. You're all in commitment. Your cross is any difficulty or cost that you have for following Jesus because you've died to yourself and you've resurrected to the new life in Christ. It's any cost, any difficulty that you have because you're a Christian. When I was a youth pastor in, in Moncton, uh, at Louisville Baptist Church, it was an old church, and we were always, always uh, fighting for storage space. It always had these little nooks and crannies, and we just never had enough storage place for all of the ministries in our church. And, and, and being a youth pastor, and, uh, we had a lot of kids, and we just had a lot of stuff to store, and, and so I was always fighting for storage space. And one of the things that we did when we were there is actually we... Uh, made a cross just like this, but it was twice the size of that. I'm talking like it was probably like a 10 by 10. It was a massive beast, taller than that. And I bet you that thing weighed 250, 300 pounds. I don't know why we made it that big, but it was huge. It was huge. And because of the nature of our stage, we couldn't, it was so small. We couldn't leave it on the stage or up front at, in, our, in our sanctuary all year long. We would bring it out for Easter and Good Friday and things like that. And special events. And so this massive beast of a cross was always being pushed around into other places. Like, where do you store a massive cross like that? It ended up being put in, a, in an unused Sunday school room here, and then it would be put, eventually it got put in the hallway, literally the main hallway of, of, our, of, of where people came and went in from the church. 
and it just stayed there laying on its side. And I was always pushing it out of the way because I didn't want this thing to fall on a kid or something like that. I was always pushing it out of the way. And it was always like this massive beast. It took everything within me just to carry and move it. And I remember in frustration one day turning to one of my youth leader volunteers. And I said, I'm so frustrated with that thing. Would you get that stupid cross out of here? And as the words left my mouth, <laughs> I realized what I was saying. Yeah, I was frustrated with just the piece of wood project, but uh, the piece of wood. But I wonder if sometimes that's the posture of our hearts as Christians as well. Would you just get that thing out of here? It's just in the way. It's just in the way. What's your cross to bear? Is that our posture? Have you ever found yourself saying that? I sense that the weight of our cross to bear in Canada is going to increase in the next few years. I'm not a prophet, but I can just sense we're heading in that direction. We just banned Dr. Seuss for some reason. If they ban Dr. Seuss, they're not going to like what's in the Bible. <laughs> if, if, if they don't like Sam I Am and Green Eggs and Ham, they're not going to like the Great I Am. <laughs> to tell them not to read it for a while. There's this thing called hate speech that's gaining traction in Canada. And we're on a trajectory that's going to basically make this book hate speech. I had a conversation with Erica just not long ago about this trajectory of things that are happening in this earth. Or, or in Canada. And I never thought I'd ever say this, but I can see a point, time, there's a probability if we keep heading at this trajectory, on this course, the cross that, that I, as a, as a follower of Jesus, as a proclaimer of the gospel, there's a, there's, there's a strong possibility that I myself am going to end up in prison. And I'm okay with that. I'm going to be in prison, not because I disobey the word, it's because I obey the word. But that's the cost. And don't worry when that happens. That's going to serve, as Paul said, to advance the gospel. I'm just, you're just going to send me on a missionary journey. Fred and I will have a great duo. I'll preach every day. He'll lead the worship. And we're not going to rest until everyone in the... The prison is a follower of Christ. But have you thought through what you're going to do when the Bible is considered hate speech? This is raw. This is real. This is it. We could talk figuratively for years about this. Possibly, maybe, oh, it's the hostility towards us. What are you going to do when this is considered hate speech? Have you thought that through, your cost and your future cost? I was in that place the other day where I was uh, <laughs> complaining about my cost. Where I was, you know, I could, we used to, and we played hockey, we used to say, do you need the ambulance? Do you need the ambulance? Do you need some cheese to go with that wine? And I was in one of those places. Oh, my cost. And then, and then somebody sent me this link to this video, and we're going to watch this as a church at some point. It's called the, in, the Insanity of God. Now, it sounds like an odd title, as if God's insane, but it's, it's from the point of, like, God asking you to do something that's costing you and you're like god you're in, you're insane to ask me to do that you're absolutely insane to ask me to to do that 
And here I was thinking that my cost right now is so, my cross to bear was so heavy. And I put what this video on and I ended up putting my hand over my mouth in silence and humility. As you see the cost of our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world and what they have gone through for the gospel. These are the people that we support in Open Doors. This is the reason why we support Open Doors. The insanity of God. It's a free movie. I'll send you the link later. But if you ever feel like your cost is too much to bear, this, this difficulty for being a Christian is too much to bear here in North America, put this on and be ready to put the hand over your mouth in silence and humility as you see the stories of these Christians who have, in Russia, pre-Soviet Union, in China, they talk about in here, in Somalia, who have paid the ultimate price I can't even begin to get into some of the stories. But have you thought through your own cost and your future cost in following Jesus? Have you thought it through? And so Jesus shocks them with this, 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 this fine print that he makes the bold capital large print here. You get, the, the family's a litmus test, so you're going to be willing to make a decision that is perceived as hate by your family, and they're going to hate you, and they're going to want to kill you, and then you're going to take up your cross. And then he tells two parables that are sandwiched in there like, like, like illustrations, warning us not to make a hasty decision, not to pick up this Jesus membership in the impulse buying aisle. And he says, in both of those stories, at the beginning, he said, in the tower, Billy and the tower, he says, won't you first sit down and estimate, won't, like, or the king going to war, won't you first sit down and consider, in verse 28 and verse 31? And we use this in our vernacular, too. When we're making a big decision in our life, whether it's moving or buying a home or buying a car or shifting a career or we're going to do some education thing, there's this major shift in our life, we'll say, we need to sit down. We need to sit down and consider and estimate and see this from all angles and make sure that this is what God is calling us to do, that how's this going to impact the kids, how's this going to impact our finances, how's this going to impact everything in our life, and we need to sit down, and we'll spend days, we'll spend weeks, and we'll spend even months sitting down with our significant other, with our family, and we'll talk this through. So you have building a tower. He says, how much you go and you, you build a tower, you, you just don't go to the store and start buying wood and start hammering nails and say, let's just see where this thing's going to go and go, what? I am out of money. Now, you, you, we all get this. It, this. This transcends even this, our culture and this culture. Like when we're going to build a building, we need to go, okay, how much money do I have? How much resources do I have? What building do I need? Let's make a plan. Let's draw it out. When's it going to be finished? How am I going to do this? Think this through. Sit down and estimate. Likewise, a, a king that's going to go to war, they don't go, oh, that's it. it's Tuesday today. What do you want to do today? Let's go to war. Mm, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's fight them. That looks like fun. No. Specifically with war, a nation sits down and goes, why are we doing this? How is it going to impact our nation in so many ways, in the cost of life, and the financial cost, and, 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 and why are we doing this? Are we going to be able to win this? There, are, there, are, there is a lot of sitting down and considering when you decide you're going to just take your nation and go run into war. You just don't go wake up on a Tuesday and go, let's go to war. This looks like fun. Impulse. Woo. Sit down and estimate. Sit down and consider. Jesus is making this large crowd do the same thing here. Hate your family. Give up everything. Carry your cross. Whew. Jesus does not just want to be part of your life. He wants to be your life. And then he goes on, talk about salt. 
He says, salt is good, but if it, it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So we're the salt of the earth as Christians, right? He says that in other parts of the scripture. It is fit neither for soil nor for the manure, manure pile. It is to be thrown out. In those days, salt was very valuable. It was used as, as a preservative. It was used to improve taste. We even use it like that today. In fact, Roman soldiers in those days were paid in salt. That's how valuable it, w- it was. You've heard the term, you're worth your salt. That actually come from, came from Roman times, where a soldier was a good soldier, you would say you're worth your salt, because they were paid in salt. So it was very valuable, because they used it for so many things, preserving food. And you can imagine, in those days, when you didn't have refrigeration, it was extremely valuable. So it was, it, was, it was a preservative and to improve taste. But in those days, salt could also lose its saltiness if it wasn't processed correctly when they made it. And when it loses its saltiness, it has no value. It's absolutely worthless. So Jesus is saying here, I'm not interested in saltless Christians. Don't start this thing and then leave it. Think this through. Sit down and consider. Sit down and estimate the cost. Are you willing to do this? Jesus does not just want to be part of your life. He wants to be your life, your everything. Back in the 5th century, I'm a history guy, so you're going to hear a history story. This is a true story. In Russia, we talk about Russia today, there's this leader named Ivan the Great. He expanded the Russian kingdom At that time, and he was so busy expanding the kingdom that he never did marry until later in life. Later in life, after he kind of, the campaign had slowed down, he decided he wanted to marry. And he found a fiancé, future bride. It was the daughter of the king of Greece. And so he traveled down to Greece And in order to marry this king's daughter of Greece, he needed to convert to the Orthodox Church and be baptized. And so he had to go through these lessons and then be baptized. And when he went down, he took about 500 of his most loyal soldiers that loved him, that would die for him and do anything for him, dressed in their beautiful armor. They wanted to do what their, their, their leader did. And so their soldiers, those 500 soldiers, wanted to convert to the Orthodox Church as well because their leader did. So they went through all the classes, and then they, the time came for them to be baptized. Baptism, as we know, and we're going to do this in a few weeks, is, is about your death to yourself and your resurrection to Jesus Christ. You're dying to everything, what Jesus talks about here, and you're resurrected to the new life in Christ, and he's your master and he's your Lord. But they had a problem in the Orthodox Church in those days in 5th century century in Greece. It was that they wouldn't baptize a soldier. Because a soldier had taken an oath to take life and kill, and he had too much bloodshed on his hands, so they needed to did not be a soldier, step away from being a soldier in order to be baptized. That was the whole thing in that church at that time. So there was, it caused a rather big kerfuffle, and so they, 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 they came to a compromise, and here was the compromise. They take all 500 soldiers down to the lake, and they baptize them, and each one of those soldiers would take their sword from their sheath, hold it high above their head, And 500 church workers would baptize all 500 of them at the exact same time while they held their fighting arm and their sword outside of the water. I'm going to die to everything except this. God doesn't get this. I'm holding on to this. What are we holding on to? Jesus says, give up everything. I'm going to ask the worship team to come.
See, Jesus doesn't just want to be part of your life. He wants to be your life. He wants you to think this thing through and not make this impulse decision. He's taking the fine print and he's, he's making it the, the capital, bold, large print. He says, give up everything. Is there a litmus test that Jesus has, the Holy Spirit this morning has, has touched in your life where you, he says, you're holding on to that? We're going to sing a song as we close. It's just a simple song. It's called Draw Me Close to You. And in this, there's a, there's a, there's a line that says, you're all I want, you're all I need. You're my everything. And maybe you're there this morning, but maybe you're not. And maybe this morning you need to sing it as a, as a response and praise, but maybe you need to respring it, sing it as a, as, a, as a longing that you need to help God release that thing. And have him be your everything. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this calling on our life. I pray this morning that we would be able to release whatever we're holding on to and make you our everything. We pray this in Jesus' name.